<laughs> there's, there's more. <clears throat> so what we're going to do now is call our committee chairs to the front, and they're going to share their reflections on the work that they're going, what's going on in their committees, and um, connect that to concept model work or work, however they want to present that. So Pam Banning, Rob McClure, and Stan is already here. So Stan, we thought you would be up first to talk about your concept model work. Okay. Yeah. So I'm Stan Huff, the cl clinical committee chair. <laughs> As if you, I'm acting in a different capacity now. Uh, so uh, this this is just a, a brief summary of things that we worked on in the committee. Uh, the clinical committee has responsibility for quote unquote cross cutting issues for for LOINC. So overall structure of LOINC. Uh, you know, the, the, these issues about the concept model, all of those kind of things. Uh, the cl clinical committee has also worked on the, our approach to questions and questionnaires and all, all of that sort of stuff. Uh, and also uh, one, one new initiative that we've discussed and actually been doing a little bit of is making uh, LOINC codes for all of the attributes and elements in standards like fire and CDA and other things, um, which is an interesting uh, part of things that we're doing. Uh, and then we're working, you know, myself and others in the clinical committee and, and with LOINC staff are working very closely with SNOMED on the, on the LOINC uh, SNOMED extension, otherwise known as the LOINC ontology. Uh, so, we want to continue definitions of uh, new concept models, and that's what I want to talk about here for a minute, uh, and design for items where the, the component is redundant with the kind, th this is really technical, so I won't um, take, take just another 30 minutes to explain what that's about, but um, that's an important thing. Um, and then again, work work on, the the next big milestone for me with in the in the snowmed uh, collaboration is to to complete lab data and then start working on clinical observations signs symptoms blood pressures heart rates all of the direct patient measurements and history and that kind of stuff so having said that um, again we already talked about this uh, the the guiding light if you will is that we want we want to enable semantic interoperability uh, we we can enforce it. We don't have regulatory capability. Uh, I don't know that we would want to if we could, uh, but we want to make the codes that enable uh, semantic interoperability. So one of the things that we've recognized and one of the things that we've taken on as a, a new task is what we call a computable concept models. And uh, so I've, I've got this example of, of what we're talking about with that. So historically, and you, you know, for those of you who are here yesterday and, and in the LOINC tutorial, the, the traditional model for the development of LOINC codes is the six axis model where you have the component, uh, timing kind of property, system, uh, scale, and then method, method kind of optional. Uh, but what we've realized and, and, and what this slide is meant to represent is what we've done over the years, though, is, uh, if you will, overloaded that, uh, put different things in there than what, what the model name would be. So going down the left-hand side of this slide, you have uh, what I've called a domain, which is lab and clinical direct patient measurements and, and document types. Those are three you know, major classes of things that exist in LOINC uh, and not to be confused with other kinds of medical domains like pediatrics versus surgery versus respiratory. This, this is, these are things that are the same based on, you know, lab is the same because it's all of the kind of observations that happen on specimens that are removed from the patient's body and uh, quote unquote clinical and a lot of a lot of almost all of nursing is related to 
things that you can see and measure directly on the patient or things that they tell you. And then document, the document ontology is about how we uh, label and tag documents so that people can find them uh, and uh, be able to find the information they want in, a, in actual uh, patient narrative kind of notes and things. But what's happened then is that, for instance, in the lab domain, that, you know, what's in the component part of the, of the model is always uh, a substance, uh, either a biological substance or a drug or uh, antigens or antibodies or cell types, all of those kind of things. Uh, but in direct patient measurements, uh, these things are coming from examinations of some kind uh, or you know, measurements like blood pressure measurements or examination of deep tendon reflexes, or in this in this example, the range of motion uh, of the joints. So it's it's a very different set of things. The things that you find in direct patient measurements, you you can quibble about. You know, uh, somebody who's wearing a pulse oximeter because that's sort of direct patient, and you can also measure oxygen saturation in the laboratory, but that's really trivial. But it, major there's there's very essentially no overlap between the the kind of things that you say in component for patient measurements versus things that you see in the lab and then the document the document ontology is actually in a whole nother space from any of these things uh it's it's not measuring a substance it's not measuring a anything it's it's what is this what kind of thing is this is this a note is this a, a consent form is this a, a consultation? What it, you know? What is it? Uh, the same thing is going on, and I won't go through the details in every one of these, but it's it's true in every one of these. And uh, in the kinds of properties that you have with within the lab area, are mass concentrations, substance concentrations, the number of cells per milliliter, you know, all of those kind of things. Uh, in patient measurements, it's surface area and angles and pressures and totally different totally different set of things uh, and if you get into the system by its nature the lab is always about specimens you know the specimen type whether it was urine stool csf etc uh, in in patient measurements the system is used as the um to describe the body part that you're measuring the angle of or that you're uh, measuring the surface area of, et cetera, those kind of things. Uh, and in uh, the system for documents, it's the setting, whether this note came from a hospital or a nursing home or uh, something else. But you get the idea. The, the point is that we've overloaded the axes within the traditional model. And so they don't, you know, if I'm talking about documents, uh, you know, system doesn't have any sort of meaning really that's consistent with other kinds of things. And so the recognition is, and what we want to do then is actually create models, uh, computable models that describe uh, the specific uh, information that's required for lab items and a different, a different and specific model that names things the right way for uh, patient measurements and the same thing for the documents and document ontology. So uh, what, we're, what we're trying to do, uh, and, and this is why, uh, is that again, we've created this dissonance between the names of the, of the six primary axes and what they actually contain, you know, based on domains. Uh, and, what what we want uh, then is to create these uh, a computable representation and the best analogy or best example I would have of this is the uh, machine readable concept model in SNOMED that uh, has a computable way of saying oh if you're making this kind of observation or this kind of measurement or this description of a diagnosis these are the parts that participate in defining what that concept means. Uh, we want to make that same kind of computable representation for the uh, for the the concept models within LOINC. Uh, and so uh, 
ultimately that has to you know, what that model should contain needs to come from the LOINC committees and from clinical experts that participate in those uh, in those committees. Uh, and we want them to use the, you know, if you will, follow the Confucius rule and name things, give them proper, give them their proper names uh, and say, you know, in, in other words, in, in the direct patient measurements, instead of, uh, you know, in, in the system, instead of calling it system, we would say this would be the anatomic body part uh, that, that needs to be there, uh, you know, et cetera. So things would be called by their same name. And so uh, we don't want the committees to worry about, there's a lot of, you know, uh, there's a lot of churn sometimes in the committees that say, well, we need to represent this piece of information because nurses need it or uh, it's needed in a subset of document names. Oh, where are we gonna put that in the six axis model? Where does that go? We have no place for it. We, so then they figure out, you know, and they they combine it back into the component or put it, they force it in somewhere. And we don't want to do that. We want, we want it to give it the name that it should have and represent it accurately in a, in, in a computable way. The knowledge of what that is has to come from people who have experience and know how they want to use the terminology in their actual day-to-day -day work. Uh, so we want the models too, to be used in a lot the same way that the, the computer, comp uh, uh, machine readable concept model is used in SNOMED, you can then actually, uh, if you have a computable model, you can say, when I make a new code, is this new code accurate according to our, uh, the way it should be defined? Uh, does it have all of the required parts? Uh, you know, how do we do that? Uh, so we can do quality assurance, if you will, it, do automated classification and automation of, of uh, the link content. Uh, we want to enable people to be able to use then those same uh, appropriate names instead of saying, you know, I want all the documents where the system is uh, outpatient or hospital. They would really say, I want all the documents that were created in the setting of a hospital or a, et cetera. So you use the prop proper name for the, for the, for the elements that are used in making the code. Uh, Part of what prompted us to do this now was uh, and is our collaboration with SNOMED, because what we found is that as we, uh, you know, what we're doing really is not mapping LOINC codes to SNOMED. What we're doing is taking the meaning of, of the LOINC codes and we're transforming them into the representation of meaning that exists in SNOMED. Uh, well, if, if we're including things in, in the components or other places that shouldn't be there, and we discovered some of those things, then we want to know that and we need to fix it in LOINC before we transform it to a bad representation in SNOMED. So that, that was motivation too. Uh, and then above all, we're just trying to be useful. I mean, we're trying to do that semantic interoperability. And so we want people to tell us what they need so that we can create the right kind, right kind of codes for it. So kind of the, the roadmap of work, if you will, is that we would we would continue to work on observables, uh, labs and subtypes of labs and direct patient measurements. And then there's some additional things that have been asked for that we, we don't have an exact class for, and it's just information that people want to record, like, you know, what's the county of, uh, of the notary that I'm using for this document? Or, uh, you know, what's the state where that notary was commissioned? Or it's it's all kinds of information that, that there's a need for, but it doesn't fall. It's, I'm not actually measuring that on the patient. I'm not, it's not a laboratory thing. So uh, there, there's some new things that we wanna do there. But then uh, panels and collections, you know, LOINC contains panels uh, and collect, I'm using that as a synonym in this case, panels and collections, you know, uh, so there are LOINC codes for things like uh, a basic metabolic panel and a comprehensive metabolic panel and for uh, liver, uh, liver uh, enzymes or other things, there are thousands of them. Uh, and it, this is just a recognition that collections of observations are not observations. <laughs> for collections, you need to know what, what does the collection contain. I need to know that in a, in a, in a basic metabolic panel, 
There's a serum sodium, a serum potassium, a serum chloride, a CO2, et cetera. And, and that, that kind of relationship between uh, the name of the, of the panel and the elements that it contains is a different relationship than exists for any other kind of loin, loin codes. And so we need to make sure that our file structures and uh, the design for that is appropriate. Then we wanna do uh, document, uh, document ontology, jo document or organization and other things. And Rob is gonna, gonna talk about that. That's our next priority to get to a computable model there. Uh, we're doing work on questions and questionnaires and, and revising the model uh, a bit about how we do those things. And then there's been a lot of work done. And, and in fact, the, the radiology and imaging committee has done, uh, is probably the furthest along. They have a human readable description of their, uh, of their current concept model. And we would, we need to make a computable representation of that, uh, a computable readable rep rep representation. But that's sort of the outline of, of, of works. And so the, the way the work would be done is that the committees would define, if you will, uh, what, what the parameters, uh, what the parts are that allow you to make an accurate loin code in a given domain. And, uh, and then that information would be taken by loin staff and engineering and computer scientists and informaticists and say, okay, we're gonna use this formalism to represent the model. And this is, this is the way the actual computable representation of that would be represented. Uh, whoops, the, uh, the work would proceed. Uh, it's hard for us to commit. I say us, I'm sort of inviting myself more in than I should. Uh, depends on the amount of resources that are available to, uh, to LOINC. And so the highest priority is for us to make codes and be able to distribute those codes and make them useful to people. This kind of work we need, you know, we, we do when, we, when we've got the essential work done, then we can do these other things with the time that remains. And so uh, it's just to say, uh, we don't have a committed timeline for when we can do all of these uh, new concept models. Uh, what's implied though, is that once we have those new models, it, we need a new database that will represent things and, and a database so that people can interact with things in an intuitive way with the names of parts of models and ask for, you know, again, be able to ask for everything that has to do with uh, patient measurements on the knee or patient measurements on, uh, you know, uh, on deep tendon reflexes, uh, that sort of stuff. Uh, and so the database inherently has to be able to recognize the names of those more well-defined parts that make up the LOINC codes. And, uh, and at the same time that we do that, we can't lose the capabilities to do hierarchical browsing. We can't lose the ability to just type in a keyword uh, and find the LOINC codes that, that whether, regardless of whether they're talking about patients or talking about lab or talking about documents would find all of the places where that keyword is used, et cetera. So there's a lot of design and a lot of work that needs to go into that. And that's part of the reason we're not committing to a specific timeline to do that. So um, that's uh, a discussion about what, if you will, the, uh, the new computable concept model is about. And uh, we wanna ask, uh, in this discussion, uh, you know what what that might mean to the committees, but we want we want the discussion to be even more open. the The real bottom line of what we want to talk about for the next couple of hours, with a break for lunch in between, is what do you need from Loink that we're not doing? What 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 could we do better? Uh, things that we're doing, but we could do better. Uh, what what are the emerging needs? What are, if you will, new, you know, do we need to do a whole bunch more things around uh, standardizing genetic data? Uh, you know, what I'm, I'm trying to have it be, you know, an outside of the box discussion about what's needed and uh, what uh, Regan Streif and HDS uh, can do, so.
that's my uh, brief report. Which tie very tightly to the sort of things that we want to try and do and very actually tie very tightly to the things that Stan's talking about. Um, the, and I'd have to, oh, I don't know what's up on the slide there. Not what I'm looking well, at. Oh, there it is. Do I actually need to do this? Okay. Should we use the same? No. Or button? See, you have to. Button's good. Okay. Button's good. So, <clears throat> um, as the, the group looked at the content and the kinds of requests that we get from you, the members, and I'm very much interested in and getting more in back, in, input on that. But as we looked at this, there was some, um, well, actually the, the words that come to mind are dead wood. So the, there was some material in the content of the way we represented documents that was inconsistent particularly when you thought about how I'm going to go and look for documents, which is the primary reason we have the document ontology. And, and so the very first thing that we did, um, which we actually, you know, talked about last year at last year's conference was to go through and be clear about what each of the um, characteristics of documents meant, what they were intended to represent. <clears throat> and there's still some overlap. And as we did that, <clears throat> we were constantly confronted with the issue that we were stuck in the six axis thing of which the document ontology only used three. And so we were taking by definition, five attributes and kind of jamming those round pegs into only four square holes, which was frustrating. And, in, and honestly for me, because it just doesn't make a lot of sense. I constantly, I have to carry this around just to kind of remind myself of how it actually works. And so the, so one of the things that we want to accomplish in this upcoming year that we've already been working on is to figure out what are the real characteristics of documents that we actually need to use to, to characterize them so that they can be, you know, found in ways that are useful and also fit into this hierarchy, right? Which is really groupings that are, again, those groupings are only powerful in the context of use, in my opinion. I mean, yes, they're useful in, in you know, going in and looking at a browser so that you can kind of subset things. And they're um, undoubtedly useful in uh, by our users when if someone's picking to characterize a document, they don't have to look at the long list. They can go down a hierarchy and pick subsets. So, so they're useful there. But we needed to be able to look at that content and say, okay, does it make sense? Is it consistent with the meaning of these different characteristics? And um, figure out, are we representing all of the important characteristics and break out of this? Oh, and then we have to fit it into primarily method, component, and system and really primarily method and component. And does that make sense? So one of the things that the work that Stan is describing where Loink is really rethinking how it represents its meaning is for the document ontology group to break free of the success, six axis model. I mean, and look at what is the importance of timing and the property and things like that. And are there other things that we need to do? So that's, that's kind of item one there. The second thing that, well, there, another big important component of that, that I don't want anyone to feel like we're, at, we're losing sight of, although we need input on this, is how these changes need to back uh, port to the existing model, right? I mean, obviously, Loink, in the integration of link into systems and particularly in the document world is set. And so obviously the download and upload. So that, that process of, of, of kind of updating to the next version is built on scripts and things like that, that expect something to kind of be created in the way it is with two th different things in component, two different things in method separated by ampersands or, up carrots and things like that. And so it's really going to be important as we move forward to this new way of thinking for folks to 
work with us to make sure that we don't break systems, but we use this change as a way of enabling new capabilities without breaking old systems. So that's something that's on our mind. Um, I think I already talked about the second bullet where we're really working on defining these distinct and um, well-defined characteristics. The uh, There's an element of the process that may or may not be known to everybody with regards to how LOINC parts, which is really what the do document ontology is, right? The document ontology is an ontology of LOINC parts that then <clears throat> point down into a LOINC of which those loink, multiple loink parts are used to create the loink, very much like what goes on with lab or, and, and, and clinical loink. Same thing happens in document loink. But the, one of the differences about document loink is that when people request that a document name be included in a document ontology, they essentially ask for a name, something big and long and that's complicated. And then there, there's the work of kind of breaking it apart and figuring out what parts go, you know, belong and where. But more importantly, then that means that there are loink parts that align with that, that get created in the document ontology, and they should have persisted meaning that actually should have meaning across more than one document, right? Those things are an aspect of, of the idea of creating the code system that is loink. But <clears throat> behind the scenes, some of that stuff is driven by the fact that we're looking for specific strings in the final name of the document. And I'll just leave it at the fact that that complicates things. <laughs> and, and so we're going to work to try and see if we can still meet that need, right? The idea that I have a string that has meaning that I need that represents documents, but also have loink parts that have consistency across multiple documents. The idea of, you know, code systems are a collection of meaningful concepts that tend to be class objects, right? They tend to be things that are true of more than one specific thing. And we use them, the value that they have is that, that we don't have to ha make a new concept for every single instance that a human mind can conceive of. That doesn't sound very useful. What we want are common elements, but still allow us to represent distinction, right? Again links into what Stan's talked about. Where's that distinction have to live? Now, you know, humans are simplistic animals and we try and kind of like, once we kind of understand something, that tool is what we want to use. And so we see evidence of that with more and more specifics into LOINC, those distinctions, but we're growing into that situation where we end up with a code for every utterance that might occur with regards to documents. And we need to break away from that, which gets to this idea of figuring out, okay, well, what parts belong in the, you know, the classic way that we talk about this is what parts belong in the information model, right? Those other pieces that you've heard Stan talk about with regards to perhaps that's a series of items that are represented by a value set of choices, but the LOINC basically just has the general idea of that, essentially a pointer to the value set or a name for the value set. So one of the things that our group has got to figure out, I want to say in the next year, <laughs> is how does that apply to documents? The sort of examples that Stan runs through tend to be focused on labs where things like method can be pulled out because they're um, something that should or tend to be represented in the information model in terms of exchange. Because just naming a document and giving like a code, I mean, maybe there's some places where that's true, but it shouldn't be true. In most places, you have a more complex information model about that piece of data that's sitting around. And so that document doesn't, that name, that link name really doesn't have to carry all the knowledge. But what parts do we bring out? So things like role, for example, could be one of those things because we usually know what who authored the document, if that's what's, you know, it, it, the, or intended use of the document, one of those two. So, so that's something that we're looking at. Like, love to get feedback, you know, come to the, come to the meetings and give us some feedback about how your organization uses, the, uses this information. What, where, what's duplicative? 
right? What are we including in documents that's duplicative or that you're never assigning documents unique character, you know, picking unique codes based on that characteristics, you're always using the general one because we want to pull that stuff out. So that's, um, that gets into this, uh, and it, it touches on the grouping hierarchy. I talked about that in a little bit and consistency with regards to the meaning of crosslink. There I'm talking about, and I use this example, advanced directive, and that's a complex, so I'm not going to get into that. Uh, but uh, but the idea of advanced directive is um, represents a lot of different things. So one of the things that it represents for us in the document ontology is that there's a series of documents that are advanced directives. And um, and so there's a, a essentially a, a category in the link part hierarchy of advanced directive that's a link part that is also used to make that string show up in certain documents. But then there's very specific, more specific ones that are kinds of advanced directives. In addition, there's this idea of an advanced directive as an observation. Do you have an advanced directive? of any kind, which is probably pretty aligned with the intent of the USCDI um, uh, V5 concept. And so LOINC needs to be able to represent both of those because we need, you know, we are this, the way we represent documents and document parts. There could be an advanced directive that's buried in a, in a larger piece and we be, need to be able to represent that. Plus, in addition, we need to be able to represent the observation that do you have a, a advanced directive? And how do those two things fit in LOINC? Are they the same idea? I think based on the things that I just said, you might say they're not. I think we might not, we might say they're not, but they have the same words, right? Are they like cold and cold in SNOMED? Maybe. So that's the, the sort of things that we have to figure out. How do they link? Well, in LOINC, they aren't linked at all using this, uh, the, the ideas that we're talking about with regards to kind of plugging into SNOMED, they could be linked. All right, so that's that slide. <laughs> um, so how are we doing it? I, I, I probably cover, talk, talked on a, a bunch of this, but these are the things that we're literally doing. One of the very first things we're doing is um, a lot of that stuff that I talked about is very ethereal and, and really could use some input. It requires a lot of work, requires support from the the link uh, HQ folks and things like that. But there's some other things that we have to do that's kind of just taking care of business. So one of them is that there's a lot of uh, document ontology oriented things that um, aren't used. So for example, one of the things that we just decided to do, and you will see in the next release, is there were there were a bunch I actually don't know the number somewhere north of 40 and probably under 70 that of link parts that were not used as a well, I don't want to use component but a piece of um, of a link so they were just they had been made usually they we believe that they had been made with the intent of using them for a link that then wasn't made you heard actually uh david ibarato talk about the fact that that exists and that they could just kind of be in link and kind of wait that's not really useful i think in the particularly in the document ontology because they show up in the ontology we're encouraging people to use the ontology as a way of searching for things and if they're not linked to anything it's going to be confusing those are all going to go. Um, similarly, well, a different thing totally, but um, there's a lot of things that are scale doc and scale NAR that are in LOINC that are not in the document ontology. You might wonder why. Well, so do we. And so part of that has to do with kind of the ideology of the creation of the document ontology and some of those then probably belong inside the document ontology some of them are properly not documents nor are they parts of a document that we want to identify so and yet they are documents and so uh so there will be things that are scale doc that are not a doc part of the document ontology 
most of those have well there's a bunch right now um gosh this would be a great question one kalush or whatever that thing was called i didn't say that other word um that uh uh so that what what would be the biggest chunk of things that are scale doc that are not <laughs> that are not in the document and apologies Does anybody know what that would be close radiology all of the remember that we said all of the radiology things have scale doc yeah survey instruments that's a good that's another good example yeah so there are some that are clearly properly identified as something like a document but aren't going to be now considered a part of the document ontology but there are some that don't fall into those buckets and probably belong same thing with the nar scale nar and so we're going to work on trying to clean that up uh we're going to explore as i've been talking about the use of the mcrm idea uh, i don't know that actually stan uses that phrase to describe this but that's basically the idea uh let's see did i cover everything else i think um the these last two bullets just kind of get back to the specific work of trying to make sure that we we do the right thing with regards to this these improvements so what you hear me say as part of my little fight them um is that we we commit to improving the document ontology, making it relevant and useful. Without your help, we're not going to be able to do it. And we're going to do it in ways that aren't constrained by the current kind of based on lab approach of these six axes. We're going to break free of that. But we're going to do it in a way that um, is backwards transformable. And that's our commitment. Well, that's it. So Pam Benning chairs our lab link committee. Can do the cover slide for a moment. I just wanted to spend a few minutes uh, addressing uh, what we've covered in the last year and a half or so at, in the lab committee. Um, semi quantitative scale was a big, big deal. Uh, it still is a big deal. There's still some questions that are coming into the forum. Uh, and so we might need to readdress or, or further address what's in the knowledge base for people to understand that we were trying to remove from the potential of algorithms or computability those types of lab tests that were not uh, sequentially numbered values they were buckets of values um, and so things like uh, test strips those aren't actual numbers you'll never get you know, a 17 year old bolinogen or something like that. Anyway, so semi-quant took up a lot of our time. And then we had an, a new request uh, come in through the forum from our friends in Ontario, Canada, where a researcher's mining um, a data warehouse for uh, drugs of abuse. And in that, her challenge was to find out how was the drug screen run? What was the method? And then originally with, with early LOINC, we took on uh, an easier approach from CLIA regulations where you can screen for a, a substance of abuse. And then if you found a positive, you had to confirm it by another methodology. We weren't identifying the methodology. We were just had methods of screen or method of confirm. And that just wasn't, uh, wasn't cutting it for um, our friend to the north. So we brought it to the lab committee and come to find out all of them kind of preferred to have the actual method identified. Now, this was moments before we had a presentation from Stan about changing the model and possibly having an answer list of the um, or a list of the methodologies. So um, that was that wrapped us up to May. And then um, we had the summer off from our meeting. So it's still an open uh, question. And um, I did want to say um, I was inspired by this morning's uh, information from the federal uh, panelists on what all needs to be tied together and, and what else can, can be improved step by step. Um, and it brought me to a couple of assignments I've had uh, through my employer uh, where I went and answered the question of what for the project, whatever that was, 
but then I stopped. And that's the type of self-limiting barrier that probably needs to be removed so that we can really go on and get this, all of this tackled the way it is. So uh, the one assignment had to do with drawing up a tumor marker value set from laboratory tests and the client wanted it to be uh, drawn up from ULMS and of course you know where I wanted to start um, but so I started you know I, I followed their request and, and got into ULMS and I was instantly brought back to my training days where with four years of chemistry you know you start with physical chemistry and then you might have some applied chemistry and then analytical and biochemical and organic and then you get on to your internship for laboratory scientists and they're like, oh, that's a very nice foundation, but now we're gonna limit you to clinical chemistry. And so Loink is focused on clinical chemistry, but if you go into ULMS, there's thousands, tens of thousands of other chemicals that are in there that since they haven't been uh, brought into lab test compendiums for uh, patient values, they haven't even been considered yet for for LOINC codes um, for research purposes and tailing on dovetailing on that for research purposes. I, I know in France and in Atlanta, I gave updates on our pharmaceutical clinical trials project where we found close to 3000 markers of flow cytometry when I go back that are not LOINC. And when I go back to the lab committees and ask each of the major reference labs do you have enough flow? Do you have enough flow? Everybody said yes. They had enough flow cytometry. They didn't need any more. And so I'm left sitting holding this bag of 3,000 rows of unmapped um, flow cytometry markers going, what is this? And, and this is the door to research. This is the door to having a challenge given to a patient uh, with some sort of medication um, that's in trial and then watching the cells to see how they respond, watching for cytokines to start being produced in the body, watching for signs that demise is coming or augmentation is coming, um, but it isn't something that gets reimbursed, you know, and so it's not in, it's not in medical reports, but it, are, it is things that happens in everybody's cells every single day with everything that you get um, exposed to. So those were just two examples of places where there's opportunities for content uh, to be developed uh, from the lab committee. Um, I'm happy to say that uh, with a couple of other projects, we recently completed a, a cancer pathology uh, compendium and we mapped that using the uh, HL7 master genetic variant reporting panel that uh, was brought up 10 years ago or so. Um, and with that, uh, with that type of framework, we were able to complete uh, a mid 80s percent matching on the first pass, which we did not guess we would get. We thought it would be much, much lower than that uh, to LOINC. Uh, and also along those lines, uh, regular labs, we might in the early days su su suspect we'd get 65, 70% mapping of a normal hospital compendium. And lately, with the um, latest releases, we're getting closer to 90, 92% matching on the first pass. So it that is becoming more thorough. Um, I didn't finish my homework assignment for Stan. Um, <laughs> I got one in A, sorry. <laughs> um, but it had to do with, um, with this concept modeling. How many ways have we stuffed things, information, into the uh, six axis model. Um, and so we're going to go into the dive into the core uh, table. And I'm thinking I'm just going to start with character length on the component field and see the longest components that we have and um, that are lab based, not attachment based, and um, see if we can start identifying the, the problem children. Um, challenges are a big part of that. The lab committee would like to tackle uh, redesigning the uh, endocrinology challenge test, but I need to make some new friends who are uh, in the endocrinology that can help us understand the best way to, to model those types. Um, the committee meets the third Wednesday of most months um, at 9 a.m. Eastern and uh, Thursday. See, I've had the summer off. 
third Thursday, 9 a.m. Eastern. Um, the Zoom link is on the website underneath committees. Um, people are um, invited to attend. Um, and I think from here, we might go on to the strategic portion. Marjorie, did you want to introduce that? Or do you want me to move no, these? Second yes. Tuesday. Second Tuesday for document ontology. This is the strategic portion. Okay. All right. So I kind of gave you a suggestion or, or a wrap up of what we've been tackling in the lab committee. To, uh, and I wanted to challenge you in this strategic session to try and uh, think outside the box and maybe throw some subjects forward of what is not getting addressed. And I don't think that should needs to be limited to lab. It can be limited to anything. No, it's, um, it's yeah, section, well, if you'd like, we'll constrain it to lab then. Uh, is there any other um, topics, breaking topics? I know there was a, a breakout lunch a little bit ago from the different state health departments. So they might have a list that they uh, are thinking things that are getting left out or things that need to be improved. But um, I'd like to open the floor, if that's okay. April's ready with microphones uh, for your feedback. Thank you. Yes, it can. It can be mapping questions. Go ahead. Uh, yes. Um, in the Netherlands, um, we are struggling also a little bit with how to address uh, point of care testing, for example. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Andrea is care. happy. <laughs> I, heard, I heard point of care. Can you repeat the last word after point of care? Uh, the point of care testing, how okay. to address it with LOINC. Uh, okay. Because the uh, the method is not always there. And I think also an important question is, should it be addressed with LOINC? Uh, if not, how? Eh? And then we go uh, about the context, uh, which information do you accompany with sending out her the result? But also, for example, uh, uh, the more genetic tests, when is it a laboratory test and when is it the patient characteristic, for example? And then you go, for example, for the blood, blood groups or uh, genetic testing and then not the hematology, genetic testing, but really uh, the... the uh, uh, where you were born with, oh, sorry, I don't know, mm -hmm. <laughs> don't come up the word in English. Should it, it yeah, should it be uh, exchanged as laboratory tests or in a different place, for example, in the patient summary? And should it be mapped with, mapped? Um, should it, should, is, is LOINC also there for a solution? Because especially when you go into NGS, it's, I think, very hard to find right LOINC codes. Thank you. So point of care, uh, Andrea, I'm going to tap in. I'm going to have you tap in here in a second, please. Um, so the point of care testing, when it first came up with laboratory committee, there was some segregation between those are not, uh, and in the United States, we have governance over the certification of the instruments and the uh, ability of laboratories to offer certain lab tests. So that's called CLIA, C-L-I-A. And um, there was some contention from the laboratory scientists that they didn't want point of care uh, alongside certified laboratory instrumentation. It's not necessarily calibrated the same. You can't be assured. You know, th those were all those were all thoughts from the '90s, possibly. Um, and that and that was also that distinction was not wanted on the medical charts. The laboratory section of lab tests didn't want point of care testing reported in there. And so we felt like, as I recall, John's shaking his head, yes, as I recall, we were like, you have to, you have to, you have to be an adult, get your get your big boy pants on and overcome this distinction of us versus them. And let's do what's best for the patient. And so um at first, you'll, I mean, you'll see glucose with a method of glucometer, but you don't necessarily see the electrolytes or the liver enzymes. About the only distinction you have is that the system may be capillary blood, 
right? Well, I've had my blood taken multiple times and they run the machine right in front of me. Sometimes it is uh, actually a finger stick that gets put in there. And then other times they, they perform venipuncture on me and then they put drops of blood onto the stick. And so I'm like, huh? So I'm sitting there getting my blood tested, having a discussion with myself on what loin code would I give this? <laughs> you know? Um, so I haven't really even taken an inventory to how wide is the point of care testing environment now? Does it go beyond liver? If I may yes. say something about it, I, I really think that indeed we need to look at the patient. So whether it's tested on the central laboratory or uh, with point of care, uh, the results should be shared. Um, but I do think it's important uh, also for the interpretation of the quality of the results, if it's uh, the results from a uh, laboratory or uh, from a point of care testing. So I don't know if that helps, but um, you often see, uh, and then I'm going with my clinical chemist pet, <laughs> and the, the, the results with point of care testing may vary more than uh, in, when it's measured on a central laboratory, for example. Mm -hmm. So when you're for, uh, of, uh, around the cutoff of decision making, it might be important to realize that as a doctor, perhaps less as a patient, um, but also for research, I think the difference should be taken into account. How? I don't know, but it should be taken okay. into account. Okay. And then perhaps even to make it more difficult, if the point of care testing is performed on the laboratory, because for example, sometimes for blood gases, it's performed by really qualified technicians, or whether it's performed in the hospital by nurses or by the GP, by doctor's assistants. So not an easy question, but the quality of the result may depend on it. Right, a lot more supporting information um, gathering to accompany it as far as where it was performed and who it was performed by. And yeah, I think I'm not saying Loink should answer exactly. all these questions. I'm, That's, hearing, you. I, I'm hearing you. Yes. <laughs> but I think it should be, well, I, I, it's also in my presentation. I should, I think we also should make clear what Loink does not solve or uh, does not give an answer to. Mm -hmm. The second part of your question had to do with genetic testing, right? Sequencing uh, those instances where um, the patient might go in. It's not ordered by a doctor, if I heard it correctly, but they went in and submitted a cheek swab or blood and they went and had sequencing done. So I was considering that patient generated health data. Would we be aligned in that? Uh, sorry again. So the, you you went on after the yeah. point of care. You yeah, also yeah. then talked about genetic testing. Yes. Right. And I thought I was hearing that there could be two points where that this could get started. The patient could provide saliva, cheek swab, something like that, and instigate having uh, 23 and me or <laughs> having some sort of, uh, DNA analysis done, but then al also on the other side, their clinician could have ordered some yeah, sort of I, I think often uh, the clinician orders it. I think that's not the difference now, but how to, because when you, for example, have a single mutation where you do a genetic test for that, it's easy to cover in LOINC, I think, but when you go to NGS or to a whole span of um, mm -hmm. uh, well, it's not my expertise, the but I'll, and, it, it, mm -hmm. I know that there are rules which you, uh, that you need to say what kind of testing you exactly did. So that's not possible to cover in Loink, I think. Have but, you seen the master HL7 cytogenetic panel? No. I'll, I'll show it to you and we'll okay. let's see. It, there's because there's quite a bit of observations encoded in there. The start of the reason, the region being studied on the chromosome, the end of it. Okay. So you can put in yeah, information about the primers. But then, how many loin codes would you like to yes. make? One model. One model. It, it's one. It's one model. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh huh. Yeah. Very good. 
Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, I mean, starting with the genetics, um, there is an H07 um, genomics reporting module and the model for genomics, it's a good point, is a little bit different. It's more generic, um, whether it's pharmacogenomics, um, you know, prenatal type testing or congenital or cancer diagnosis. There's all kinds of different kind of sub panels if you were within the report and how to report it. And a lot of times, because there'd be highly pre-coordinated terms and pre um, combinatorial explosion from a link perspective, it's more of this generic kind of fill in the blank with, you know, what is the gene or what's the marker, what's the mutation, et cetera. So it kind of standardize, standardizes it, but it's a little bit different than your typical link codes. So it's a little bit different approach. So that's one thing just to keep in mind and we can talk offline on those guides and things. Um, I think it's still work in progress because a lot of genomics is not to the point where it's discrete. We still have a lot of PDF reports out there. And so you can't attach terminology and coding. So I think there needs to be a movement so that that data is available and actionable um, for precision medicine and a lot of healthcare decisions based on that. So that's kind of the first point. Getting back to point of care testing. Um, the question came up with COVID when we had a lot of the point of care tests that came to the market for self-testing. And sometimes the same vendor would have it in a healthcare setting, as you were talking about, and there are different trust issues. Um, so we kind of brought it up last year with the kind of the cross paradigm work group on things. So with point of care testing in a healthcare setting, you know, that you'd have CLIA requirements and things that apply, but so, um, so that a lot of that is managed under the laboratory and reported under the laboratory. You have a laboratory order, you have a laboratory results structure. Interestingly, there's an at-home testing HL7 guide and fire that was developed. And one of the interesting paradigms is when you're a patient, you don't have an order from a clinician. You're the one making the decision on if you're going to your local pharmacy to get a point of care test. And it could be anything from urine drug screens. Pam, I think we saw one that was an albumin. Yep, albumin uh, creatinine for kidney function. So this this market is expanding, right? Because it's convenience, ex accessibility. Um, there's a lot of things coming to market. I mean, we've even seen like a point of care CBC, I think for some oncology patients that's been advertised. Um, and there's also other entities kind of like Theranos that are doing other paradigms. And we think about the smart watches and the smart devices. There's all kinds of technology that's being developed and recording this information. And one of the things I think we talked about too are the continuous glucose monitors. Mm -hmm. There's the ones that are, I'll say lack of a better term, the patch on the arm. I know some of those vendors want to do more sports medicine personal fitness interest in doing lactates and other types of things for self-monitoring. There's a lot of things that are not lab related, even coming out of smartwatches, you know, the EKGs now, you know, sleep apnea, we heard some of those. So the question is, how do we distinguish them as you were saying, because we want to know where the origin of these items are. If it's a patient, is it something we can trust? Because the patient, we don't know if they dropped the home pregnancy test in the toilet, if they swabbed their dog's nose for their COVID test so they could get into a concert, so it's negative. There's so many different factors that impact the quality when you're taking out of a health professional performed or the regulatory aspects that can impact the results and the values, interpretations, et cetera. So in FIRE, with the at-home test kit, it allows you to indicate who collected the specimen, who performed the test. And so it was it a healthcare professional role. What was it? The doctor, the nurse, the lab professional, et cetera. Or was this performed by a patient or a family member? We've heard in different countries, there are family-based healthcare where there's a group of people taking care of other people. So there's a lot of different paradigms out there. And there are roles that can, for that person that collected the test, we also heard public health wants to know because it impacts their decision-making. Maybe they want to do confirmatory testing or for their epidemiology for things that are public health reportable. So these are all good questions. I don't think they've all been fleshed out, 
going back to the continuous glucose monitors, there was someone, I won't name names, but it was on an HL7 um, discussion, like, oh, can I use the glucometer glucose for this insulin um, implantable device that measures both insulin and glucose? Because now there are entities that want to get these from patients for diabetic monitoring. Can we get it off the device into an EHR, run analytics, AI, whatever the case might be? How do we distinguish what this is? And I'm like, this is not a capillary specimen like you would do for a glucometer. This is interstitial fluid. So it's different. And I see that there's new link codes for those. So thank you for whoever created those and submitted those. But how do we get folks with these new devices to make the requests of Regenstrafe so the codes can be created so they can be used for these informatics needs and interoperability. So that's going to be, an, I think, an ongoing challenge. If we have smartwatches and things too, how do we, you know, they're measuring the skin or, you know, the, the new methods. Even when Theranos came out, my question was they had HIV tests and other public health reportables. If they made it to market successfully and we're still in existence. You know, those are different types of testing for specimens. You know, it's a little bit different methodology. You know, what a new link could be needed to distinguish those um, and any limitations or differences in those values. So I think it's gonna be an ongoing discussion on, on those types of things. There are things in HL7, again, with some of these fire implementation guides for, They've tried to delineate out some of this information. I think the other part is how do we get it into the medical record system and keep it distinguished? Right, that the pipes. This the, morning, the analogy about the pipes and the conductors, this is an entirely different set of pipes. Yeah, um, and, and this is where the behavior question came up because you could report using your messaging portal as a patient to your provider using the EHR system but most patients are not gonna know the link codes for their tests, mm -hmm. even though they're on the CDC website for a lot of the COVID tests and, and PACs and other things. Um, so the health professionals are not gonna know unless the patient gives them enough information about that IBD test kit. So you know, how do you know the sensitivity specificity of, the, of a particular test? Um, we need to have a way, and I think this is something that's gonna be work in progress, to get these point of care tests, get them into the EHR. They do need to be kept distinct and separate from lab performed results. CLIA, and I think it's either CLIA or, CLIA or CAP accreditation says the laboratory director can decide what goes into the LIS basically. Most of them don't want patient performed lab tests yep. because uh, they don't want to impact their accreditation. An inspection. So it's going into the EHR buried in a clinical note somewhere where it's not very accessible or usable. Yeah. So, you know, it's getting in, in and onto the EHR. You know, is it something where you have to build these in a different data dictionary so they are available, they can be discreetly encoded and usable? So a lot of good questions, a lot yes. of things that I think need to be worked through because as we kind of think about these types of data elements, because people want it it's growing. Are we going to address it? Thank you. Thanks. Are there any other questions? All right. Well, if anything wakes you up in the middle of the night, um, log on to the community forum the next morning and send it in and we'll keep a growing list. So thank you. I'm ready. Turn it over. Barge, are you up? So there were no other questions, Rick, for any of our chairs. Are there comments, Rob, that you'd like to add? Stan? Okay, we have what we need now. Okay, I'll, say, so we'll I'll say one thing okay. about the, I, I, I would take this idea about point of care. <clears throat> I was just looking up, because it obviously it came up in COVID. There was a manufacturer that put out or at least was planning on putting out a device that did molecular testing at home that 
could be programmed or something, some chip you put on it so it looks for COVID or it looks for, you know, equine blue, you know, just whatever. With the idea, which makes a lot of sense, that with those kinds of things available, and that doesn't have to be at the home, it could definitely be in a physician's office, you could start doing early screening for pandemics. So I see those as likely versus not likely. And um, and I just, you know, so one, I think we need to really push our organizations to understand that link codes are never going to carry all the information that we need. And that means that, for example, and you, you use genetic testing as an example, that you're not going to get a link code that's going to tell you every unique genetic test. You're going to have to take an object, uh, an uh, information object, and you're going to get all these pieces. And that's when it's, that's what's going to give you all the information. And I think there's an element of that that's going to we're going to start drifting for all of observations to think about taking complex objects, which is exactly what Stan is pushing us to think about. He's saying, look, let's pull some of this stuff out of Loink and, and, and put it into other places. We have the same thing in documents with regards to patient-generated documents. Um, it's not as complex in documents in some ways, but I, I just, you know, so the lesson learned for me in this discussion that really this entire conference is stop thinking about Loink as the only thing you look at when you're thinking about observations, you need to think of complex objects. Any more comments? Okay. So let me just say that um, our committee meet, our committees meet once a month for, throughout the year. Um, so please feel free if you wanna join the committee, et cetera, there's instructions on our website on how to do that. <clears throat> but our chairs are here uh, throughout the conference if you have questions, et cetera. Some of our other chairs, you have a question? Sure. Hi, my name is Marina, last name is Grover. Um, I'm public health terminologist at CDC. Uh, it's um, a question regarding genetic testing. Uh, 250 laboratory in CDC, so these variable diseases also, they are testing about like set of tests I just received to codify. It was E. coli and it was about genes, specific genes of each, probably about 20 of them. I would not say the exact number, um, the result for this test will be positive or negative. And you said it's not very possible to cover all genes, but those particular tests supposed to either or be positive for certain gene or negative. So do you think that is possible to codify each of these genes? Because yeah, you're asking getting... the wrong person, but I'll answer anyway. <laughs> Uh, I ask in, I, I, no, but, no, I made the Thanks. comment and she'll have to defend it. Um, so the reason I jumped at the answer to that question is it's a dilemma. It's a dilemma actually for me and in, in terms of my work for Loink. Loink has a longstanding and continuing commitment for making concepts for things that are requested. And Stan will say this when he talks about the work that he's promoting in that we have um we are going to we want to continue to do that so for example if cdc came to us and said look there's there's 20 genetic variants of e coli and we want to be able to um put them all on a series of blots and um and and then we'll get yes no answers for every one of those and can you give us a link for every one of those the answer would be yes um but we don't want to do that everywhere. And the reason that we don't want to do it everywhere is that, that you know, the, obviously the combinatorial explosion and the fact that it, it allows us to think that all of the information we need is in this little code. When in fact, all we've done is post, you know, pre-coordinated information that the information model generally should carry, which creates all kinds of issues. So, so it's, a, you know, it's a, it's a yes with a squirm 
And the intent is to make clear how that gets transformed to this idea that we really want people to understand and incorporate. I mean, I would rather tell you no, <laughs> but we'll tell you yes. Would you agree? Yeah. Yeah, I would agree. Uh, I mean, to to really reinforce sort of the generality of the principle, one of the things that we ran into early on in in Loink is that people wanted to say basically, uh, "Do you have diabetes mellitus?" and have the patient answer yes or no. Do you have arthritis? Yes or no. Do you have? And we quickly saw all that would do is replicate SNOMED in a slightly different context with people saying yes or no. They're, you know, semantically, they're different concepts. One is the name of the disease. And if you will, if you make a loin code out of that, it's the question that asks whether you have that disease. But the, the principle behind that is to say, no, what we really would rather do is have a slightly more sophisticated information structure that says, uh, I'm gonna ask a question that's a yes or no question. And the subject of the question is whether or not you have this disease, and you use the SNOMED code there to to uh, to name the disease as part of that structure. And so uh, the point is that you know you you could lots of numbers, so we're not going to run out of numbers if we wanted to make loint codes that said yes or no for every condition and diagnosis that exists in SNOMED. That's doable. It wouldn't help the world. You know, that wouldn't be a good solution for the world. And and it's similar for, for genetic testing and other things. Uh, you know, uh, there are tests now and and it's but it's it's kind of an evolving set of things. I mean, back back when Loink started, I don't know, there were probably a hundred genes that you could routinely test for. And now you can sequence everything in the world and you're not only worried about the genes, you're worried about the variants of the genes. And the alleles and all of the all of the other stuff and the 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 counts of the the repeats of the anyway <clears throat> you just I, I you don't I don't know where the boundary is and we probably have to talk about individual cases we we brought up a couple of cases already where you say you know uh, this is this is how much information you want to have in the loint code. And then there's additional information that's mandated that be sent so that people can use the data accurately. And that's not a new thing uh, because what we've known forever, for instance, is that LOINT codes don't say the unit of measure, but you have to have the unit of measure to accurately interpret the, the, uh, the result of a numeric test, a quantitative test. The other thing that I, that I become impressed with more and more is the value, at, and, and we need to work as an industry on making really accurate reference ranges, okay? Because so the, the reason that we care about some of these other things is because of the accuracy of the test, that one method is more accurate than another, that uh, it, it might have been done by a more skilled technologist, it might have been done by something, anyway, the, most of that gets normalized out if you if you get very sophisticated in making the reference range and being able to say, oh, in a patient who has this diagnosis, who's on these diag uh, on these medications, then the measurement for that patient should be within this range, and then you know whether it's abnormal and whether you need to take cl clinical action based on that. Uh, similar similar kind of of details around drug testing and other kinds of, you know, testing for antimicrobials, et cetera. Uh, what, what we found during COVID is, oh, you know, to really know the probability that this test is accurate and, and indicates the patient has COVID, uh, I not only need to know that you're testing for COVID-19, I may need to know uh, whether you're whether you're looking for antigens or antibodies or whether you're looking for the DNA or the RNA in the organism, I may need to know the instrument because the instruments are not all equally reliable. I may need to know the actual source of your reagents because the reagent, turns out that the reagent manufacturers have different sensitivities and specificities of, of the reagents. Well, 
having said that, what the, I guess the points I'm trying to emphasize is that what there, there are kind of two important questions. What are all of the things that have to be known to accurately interpret this result? How many of those are useful? How many of those attributes are useful to put into the LOINC code? And how many do you want to mandate that they be sent, but they're not sent uh, as part of the meaning of the LOINC code, they're sent as individual attributes in the message. And that's actually not a decision for LOINC. That's going to be mandated by people who are either smart <laughs> and, and know the right thing to do, or it's going to be mandated in regulation or by the CDC to say, this is how, this is how we want diseases reported. But what, what I think I can, you can say without question is we don't want to make LOINC codes that say, this is a COVID test from this Abbott instrument with these reagents coming from somebody with this. That, that, that makes nobody's life simpler to do that. And so I think what I'm trying to do is just, as we think about things, uh, think about what, what is going to be, number one, you're, we're not saying that you're not going to send the information. So, you know, going back even to the, the other point of care question, it's absolutely, you know, it, it's absolutely essential that you know whether it was point of care or not point of care. That's really important for a set of users. Uh, at the same time, you say that, that doesn't mean we have to make loin codes that say, you know, serum sodium by point of care, serum potassium by point of care, serum a better way to do that is do post coordination to say, but mandate that that has to be sent. So it, it it all comes down to you know one thing that that Rob said too. You know, all the information we don't we have to get into into thinking about what what should be in the LOINC code and what should be mandated other additional information that that has to come to make. Uh, the meaning of that measurement understood and computable by everybody who wants to use it. And that's, it's the community that decides that. And what LOINC is doing is trying to enable whatever it is. So when I talk about post-coordination, I'm not trying to dictate that anybody should do post-coordination. I know what I want to do about it in my database, but the obligation of LOINC is to enable that. So people who do want to do post-coordination can. We have no authority to dictate whether you do post-coordination or pre-coordination or anything else. But what we do want to do is get to semantic interoperability. And we want we want to be make it so that people can use the LOINC codes to really achieve semantic interoperability. And that's always going to involve some degree of pre- and post-coordination. And so we, as a community, we need to talk about those issues and decide what's the best way to do it. Can circle back to where you were describing it's an Escherichia coli that's found, and then you have 20 genes, positive or negative. If you look at that HL7 master cytogenetics panel, you'll find that there are LOINC codes for what gene is being tested, and then what mutations were tested for or what mutations were detected. Those are already LOINC codes that exist. So if I understand correctly, you might already have a label in your LIS where you've got for whatever organism, and then you've got some gene names, so they are built as uh, the, what's being tested right there. If you shift the database to just have one field for what gene is being tested and then use that LOINC code, and then your answer becomes the, the actual gene name, then that master framework would work for you. But it's, I mean, it's a, it's a consideration, yeah. But you can always submit for them. Mm-hmm. I understand it's quite conv convoluted and oh good. Let's have a sidebar. Okay. So as I was mentioning, um, our three chairs are here all week for the conference. If you have additional questions for them, please feel free to have sidebars as uh, Pam mentioned. Um, the other two co-chairs uh, for radiology, or three co-chairs for radiology and nursing could not be with us. Um, you can find their contact information on our website.